My name is Margaret Mbindio. I'm an academic advisor and an assistant professor in the Department of Academic Advisement and Student Development at Millersville University. I also serve as the coordinator for advisement in the College of Arts and Humanities and Social Studies, and also the College of Business. Uh, today, we have the honor and are so pleased to welcome Dr. Charlie Nutt to Millersville University as the second speaker in the Academic Resilience Series. Dr. Nutt is the Executive Director of the National Academic Advising Association. It's usually called NACADA, which is the Global Community for Academic Advising. And it has its headquarters in the Kansas State University. As Executive Director of NACADA, Dr. Nutt is responsible for coordinating the work of the Executive Office staff, as well as working with NACADA Board of Di Directors the NACADA Council, the Association of Global Initiatives, and many other things that he's doing in that office. As a member of NACADA myself, I have heard him speak several times, and he has a heart for student success. It's therefore a great honor to have him talk to us, and especially our students during these difficult times. Please join me as we welcome him to speak to us, Welcome, Dr. Nutt. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margaret. And I'm so pleased to be here and have this opportunity to talk with you all. Um, and probably more important than anything Margaret said is that, that I'm a teacher and that that's been my focus my entire life. I started teaching uh, many, many years ago. Um, and this was all I wanted to do was teach. And advising is really about teaching and learning. And that's how I got involved with advising. So. I'm going to start my slides. It's going to take me just a minute to get the, the screen share going. Okay. I hope you can see my slides, Margaret. Are they on the screen so I know they're there? Yes. Yes, okay. we can. All right. um, so what I want to talk about today is how do we think about reimagining your advising relationships on your campus to really support this culture of student success, this culture of resilience, and then really about how advising and all the work that you do in, in developing these supportive relationships, particularly in this, in this time of need, in this time of change that we're all going through. Um, you know, I think we just have to admit up front that, um, you know, this past fall, this past spring rather, was, was a, a trying time for everyone. Uh, we were all you know, going on a merry way, having classes, working and, and, and moving forward. And then March hit. And so many of us moved home. So many of us began taking classes, teaching classes, advising, working with our advisors in a virtual space. And while we might all take online courses at times, the idea of being totally virtual in every relationship you have becomes very different within that. Um, and so how do we really think about those supported pieces of what we need to know? So one of the first things I think is, when you enter an office, an advising office, as you're working with your advisor, as your advisor is working with you, and this can be virtually, this can be, be in person. But one of the things that we want to be sure that we really think about as we talk to and work with folks is number one, that everyone's being respected. Everyone's being respected for who they are, for what they bring forward, for their skills, their abilities, for their differences, for their similarities, that it is a culture in which we are all respected, we are all valued, we are all heard, and that most importantly, that you matter. Because one thing that we, got, we have to recognize is to be successful, it's important that students truly feel respected, truly, students feel, truly feel they matter. And as you build those relationships with each other, with your faculty, with your faculty advisors, this becomes key within this. I think this is important to, to just say up front right now is I'm talking about advising that is not registration because academic advising is not about course scheduling. It's not about registering. It's about learning together how best for you to be successful as a student and how to build these partnerships and relationships. So as I talk about advising today, I want you to get out of your mind the concept of that's who I go see to get my course schedule, but this is a relationship I need to build and what I can expect from advisors, what they can expect from me, 
But even more importantly, these are the relationships you want to build with your, your, your teachers, your colleagues, your co-students, your uh, folks within the academic support areas, because so much of what we're talking about is being engaged and being a part of the campus as we move forward. They went to recognize it way back in 1993, Vincent Tito, who was an expert in student success, really did talk about retention of student success as a byproduct of good educational experience. And what that really means is when we think about whether you want to graduate, when we think about whether you're going to come back next semester, all of those pieces that play into that, that we're really talking about what is that educational experience that you're having? What is that relationship you're having with each other? What, that, what is that relationship you're having in the classroom? You're having with your advisors? Because the educational experience is more than just what courses I take. It's how do I connect those courses? How do I build together with how I want to be successful? So what we've got to think about is we think about uh, whether, we're, whether we're going to you know, return next semester, whether we're going to graduate. We're really talking about what is my educational experience? And there in this particular time, these trying times, how do we develop those virtually? And how do we build these relationships virtually? And those become really key to us as we think about at least through the next year. You know, you, you may be uh, having some online courses, I mean, some on-campus courses, but I think we recognize that the, the, this semester is very different than we've had before, and we don't really know what spring semester is going to look like at this point. But regardless of that, how do you build those relationships? How do you nurture each other? How did you become a nurturing uh, member of the advising um, relationship with your advisor? Because it's not just about your advisor doing what, doing all the work. What do you do? And how do we bring this together and think about this? So this we need to think about is advising is not just registration. It's how you get connected to the campus. It's how you feel a part of someone looking out for you, especially in this virtual time. When you have a question, when you have a concern, when you have an issue, who is it you need to turn to? And, and so many times it is the academic advisor. How do we connect with them? And oftentimes, we're going to have the opportunity to connect with some of these folks virtually more than we might have done face-to-face -face because of differing schedules. And so that times that you were not able to possibly connect with someone, you now will be able to virtually, but how do we build that together? We need to recognize, of course, that when you come to college, it's a new world. No matter whether you've been in high school right before college or whether you've been in high, out of high school for many years, college is not the same as high school. I will talk about that in just a moment. But your advisor is the person who can help interpret what that is that you need to know. Advisors are the way to help make those connections. So that as you're thinking about what you want to major in, as you're thinking about how to be successful in this next course, your advisor is the one who can build those connections and make those work. So one of the things advisors can help you with as you think about is what's the amount of time needed versus expectation. And I think one of the ways that we can look at this be so important is you hear people say a lot at orientation or in a class or in a, a, a student success seminar sometimes, you will hear the concept that for every one hour you're in class, you should study two hours outside of class. Well, let's be honest. How many of you have ever studied eight hours a day? Probably that's not something you come to college with the expectation or, or the understanding of how to do. So one of the ways to look at it is most of you will say that if you were in, when you were in high school, if you read the book, and if you participated in class, 80% of what you did to be successful happened inside the classroom. 20% might have been outside the classroom. In college, that's going to totally flip-flop. 20% is what happens in the classroom, but 80% is what happens outside. <clears throat> what are you doing to work together? How are you working with your advisors? How are you working with each other? Recognizing that you're going to be expected to do a lot of outside work to be successful that isn't always connected to the in-class work. And so it really becomes important to recognize that it's a different concept in thinking of how you prepare. Because if you go to class with the idea that I'm just going to listen and take notes and you haven't done the outside reading or you haven't done the outside lab or project or whatever, 
it's going to be very, success, very difficult to be successful. So that's the first thing that as you're working with your advisors, you can have that conversation. And then the second is, what's that particular program of study and what's involved versus perception? This is where we really get into, do you know what it is to really major in X or Y or whatever the case may be? And it really becomes important to think about because many times people will say things like, you know, I want to major in, in, in nursing or in the health fields because I want to be success. I, I want to help people. Well, you know, folks, there's a lot of ways to help people that has nothing to do with the health field. You know, let's say I've never really been really good in science or, you know, I don't really like to, to, to see blood or I don't like to focus. Well, you know, you're probably not going to do very well as a nurse. So what is it you really want to do when you say you want to help people? What does that mean? And recognizing that what you, what you think a program means and a program study is maybe very different from another. The same might be if you want to be a teacher. You know, many people say I want to be a teacher because I love children. Well, you know, I don't think most teachers really love children when they haven't just spent eight hours a day in the classroom with kindergartners. You know, it really does come down to, I want to teach. I want to help people be successful. So how do we think about doing that? Yes, it's great to love children. Yes, it's great to, to enjoy working with, with students. But it's also an idea that it's more than just that concept. It's also how do you teach? How do you work with those partnerships? Uh, do you want to major in computers or in computer technology? Because I'm really good in all the computer, but you're really good in the computer with gaming. Well, maybe maybe a, a degree in gaming or a degree in technology that supports that is really what you're talking about, but not a programming position. So as you begin to think about what your program study is, it really is a place that your advisor can help you begin to look at what it really is versus what your perception may have been. A lot of times students come to college and say they want to major in business, which means I want to major in money. I want to get a good job. I'll make a lot of money. I hear business people do that. Well, you know, there's a big difference between those two. So how do we begin to think about why are you in college? What is it you want out of college? And then how does every decision you make, every connection you have with a, an advisor, every connection you have with a faculty member has to support that desire to achieve your degree, that desire to move forward in why you came to college to begin with. And the next is that college versus college culture versus high school experience. You know, in high school, it's very much a, a parental type of relationship. We're going to tell you you have to be in class at six hours a day. We're going to, we're going to check up on you if you don't show up. We're going to, to call your mom if you don't do well on a test. We're going to, that's kind of the culture of high school. College is very different. College is where you expect it to be independent. You're expected to build those relationships, those sort of nurturing partnerships with each other, with your advisor, with your, your faculty member, in order to be successful. Because no one's going to call your mom and say you need to take No one's going to call your parents and say you need to so and so. Because this is your degree, this is your college. So the culture in which you take responsibility for success is really very different from the culture you came from high school with. And that's whether you just graduated from high school or whether you graduated from high school many years ago. That culture of everyone else achieve, making sure you achieve is very different from the college culture in which we're going to help you achieve, but you have to be independent and you have to help to find those types of relationships you will build and move forward. Uh, I love this article. It was by Eric White, who's the former kind of president. And he talks about academic advising and higher education, a place at the core. Either a place at the core curriculum, but also a place at the core of what you want to do. So he says the purposes of academic advising are contextual so they can make reasoned demands. Let's talk about that for a moment. Many times you make unreasonable demands of your faculty members or of your advisor. What you expect from them might not be reasonable. In, where, in, in what their role is. So advising helps you understand that. But even more importantly, many students make unreasonable demands upon themselves. I can work full time. I can be a single parent. 
and I could take 15 to 18 hours a semester and be successful. Well, you know, that's probably not reasonable. That's probably not a reasonable demand to make upon yourself because it's important you understand that in college, you've got to recognize that, that you have a responsibility to your classwork and to being on your campus and being involved. And right now it's called how you do that virtually. So that as you think about this, how do we virtually make sure that we're not making unreasonable demands of ourselves? We have to really think about those and put those together. But more importantly, not more importantly, but just as importantly, those reasonable demands as you set and enact the goals of your lives. It's not just about getting a college degree. It's not just about remaining enrolled in classes. It's about what are your goals? What do you want from your life? What do you want to move forward with? And how, to, how does college help you to set those and to then develop a pathway in which to achieve them? You're never going to achieve a college degree or achieve a goal in your life without clearly designing a plan for how you get there. And that plan needs to be short-term and long-term. It's got to include those pieces that I can't make an unreasonable demand of myself in just the 24 hours a day I have. So what do I need to do differently? Or I can't put an unreasonable demand for myself that I'm going to finish this degree in X amount of years when you know that there's going to be very, lots of extenuating circumstances that may hit you there. So how do we think about that? So what is, what is advising teach you as students? And what, is you, what do you need to make sure you get from the advice experience? Well, first of all, how do you craft your education? I'm going to repeat again. It's not about course scheduling. It's not about registration. When you're putting together the plan or your educational plan, you need to make sure that you know that it's not just about which courses do I take this semester, but why do I take these courses? And how do I make the, the selection of these between those that are all virtual, those that might have some on-campus experience, especially right now as we're seeing more things virtual, it becomes how do I craft that education around the virtual experience? Once again, how do you understand the path that you've chosen? If you know that, that you want to get a business degree or a business administration degree or a degree in political science or a degree in English, whatever your degree path is, whatever your plan is, do you understand how you get there? Do you understand what it requires of you? And do you understand that when you get there, you want to move forward and go past where you began and how you get to where you want to be? Building those relationships right now in this time of need is so very important because virtually you can feel alone. Virtually you can feel by yourself. So how do you make that connection virtually with your advisor in order to see and work with them to learn these things that you need to learn to be successful? How are you going to use what you learned in college? What, how are you going to take that college, that, those skills and knowledge, and use them in the workplace as you get a degree, as you move into a, a graduate program. Whatever your goal is, how are you going to use what you gained as an undergraduate to be successful when you leave college? So it's not just about I can pass three math courses, I can pass four foreign language courses, I can pass five, whatever the, whatever the requirements are, it's not just about that you can pass a course. How are you going to use those skills, that knowledge you gained when you move to the workforce? What's going to make you a good employee? What's going to make you a good graduate student? What's going to make you a good whatever your goal is? And how do you use those skills and knowledge that you've gained in your undergraduate experience to be successful? One of the things that's important to hear and recognize is it's not just your higher education experience that's being morphed into new and different ways because of the pandemic and because of the need to connect virtually with each other. We also are going to see a massive change in how businesses run and how industry run because we're seeing more and more of those companies going virtually. Well, how do you build a relationship with your coworkers when you're in a virtual environment? How do you begin to think about those? How do you create that culture of learning, that culture of 
resilience all through your undergraduate experience. How do you understand that it's not just about getting to my major courses, but how do I make sure I have my core curriculum requirements done in my first two years? How do we build a whole culture around being successful in everything you do? How do you build those virtual relationships with your faculty member? How do you build those study groups virtually that are going to help you be successful in your classes? How do you build those tutorial situations virtually that will help you do the best on that next test or that next essay you have to write for your English course? How do we build that culture of learning? How do we build that culture of resilience all throughout your undergraduate experience? Being successful in college is not just about a si a, a surviving the first year. It's about what do you do every year in order to be successful because every single year is going to require new responsibilities for you, new expectations for you. And how do you think about that as you build that program, as you build that culture of learning and resilience around what you do? And then being engaged is so important. You are not simply taking isolated courses. You are taking courses in which you learn the skills, the knowledge, the behaviors, the, the, the study habits, the relationship building in those courses in order to really become engaged in your education, not just be taking courses to do a checkbox. How do we move that forward? And recognizing that building those relationships, being engaged virtually during this hard pandemic time, is something we have to really begin to think about, is how do I ensure that I'm remaining connected with my university? I'm not going to possibly be able to drive up there and park or move into the classroom or move into the residence hall, whatever the regulations and process that Middlesbrough is going through, which is happening everywhere in the world right now. How do you become engaged in your college experience in ways that really help you become, it can become successful. Because it's not all about getting the almighty job. It's about becoming a different educated human being. What are you learning about working with diverse populations? What are you learning about how to be inclusive in your workplace with those who look differently than you? Or may behave differently than you? Or have different needs and desires than you? How do you build that? Because college is where you need to learn those skills, those abilities to work with people who are different in order to be successful. That's about becoming engaged in your college degree, engaged in your educational experience, because that engagement is what's so important in order to be successful. So what's it mean if we're going to be learning focused? And, you know, what's all that talk about? What do we really learn to talk about? First of all, is the, lib is the uh, learning you're doing liberating or transactional? Is it just checking out boxes? Is it just I do exactly what I need to do in class, but I don't read that extra book that was given to me? Or I don't really think about those other ideas. I don't see how English and history connect or how history and philosophy connect. I don't see it as liberating. I don't see it as freeing me to look at what I can do, not just be in the transactional mode of I'm only going to do what I have to do. So how do we come liberated and build our learning experiences to a great deal? We need to talk about what you're learning and how you're learning it. You know, is it all virtual? Is it in class? What do you expect to do in the classroom and outside the classroom? So as you think about building these relationships with your faculty member, with your advisor, it becomes talking about how do I organize my life around what I'm trying to learn and how I'm trying to learn it in this process. And particularly as we think about these, these programs, these courses that perhaps weren't virtual before, but now are, is how do we change the way we learn, the way we think? I may be someone who really learns very well from a professor lecturing. But it's not just his lecture or her lecture. It's how do they interact with me as students in that classroom? How do they really 
make sure that I'm engaged in that classroom. And that's all much harder to do virtually. It also means that you've got to talk about how you build these partnerships with your, your family members because you're going to be expected to spend a lot more time in, in perhaps what you were doing with, with coursework than they're used to seeing you spend. How do we begin to do that? How are you going to apply what you've learned to the workforce? How are you going to apply it toward getting that degree? How does, how does first-year seminar apply to what I'm doing when I graduate? How do I make those connections? And advisors and faculty are the way you build that, that knowledge to be able to connect those connections and connect those learning experiences together. So it's important that we think about that as you're thinking about working with your advisor, your faculty member, that it may not be the same as it was in person. There may be more requirements of you or expectations for you, but it's important to understand the faculty are working on the same set of, of, of issues, and they're also looking at how do I reach out to you. The advisors are also talking about how do I virtually connect with you. So understand that this is not a one-way street. It's not just about you finding these ways, but the university is finding these ways. And then how do you put, bring those together, your knowledge, the university's knowledge, your skill set, your learning mode? How do you work with the university, with your faculty, with your advisors, with your friends, with the folks in residence hall, Greek life, whatever you may have? How do you build those in order to be successful? And that's so important to think about. It's that current position and how do we move to where we want to be from where we are. Another great book and what undergraduate um, experience, what focus in institutions matter most. And, and what does it matter? What, what, what does God, John Gordon and his team say? Well, first of all, he says we have everything we need. We are optimistic. Let's be honest, folks. Many of you would not be enrolled this semester or teaching this semester if you weren't optimistic because we have no idea what the future is going to look like. And we're dealing with a whole new set of experiences that we have to learn that we weren't expected to learn. A whole group of, of ways that we need to connect that we weren't expected to do it that way. So how do we really think about that we're optimistic? How do we carry that into the classroom? Takes a lot of patience. Takes a lot of patience. Not just on your side, but also the faculty and advisor's side. We're all learning together this new paradigm. You know, it's not that as if your faculty had eight months in which to plan this, or your advisors had eight months in which to plan leaving campus and going to go and, and do things on the, the vowel nature. It's tough to understand that we've got to be patient with each other because not everyone's ready to move at, the, at this pace that you might be ready to move. But you don't leave them behind. You figure out how to bring them with you. And that's become so important as we look at this. It's all about teamwork. You know, the best team that you can have as a student is that team that consists of you, an academic advisor, and your faculty member. And then all those other relationships, such as the library or or financial aid, or tutorial services, all of them come out of that triumphant of three that you want to connect with. And the last, it just takes a lot of hard work. You're not going to be successful in college if you're not willing to put forth the effort. And the one piece that's so important to this virtual time is it also is the, the possibly due to the experience of getting to campus, the experience of the virtual of classes we're taking and how do we build those and put those together. But the one thing to understand folks is there's no quick fix. There's no gimmicks. There's no magic bullets. There's not one thing, one single piece today that I'm going to tell you that if you latch onto that one piece, that's going to make you successful. It's bringing it all together. Looking at what is that, that module four that material that is, that is cultural, that is talking about inclusion, that's talking about all those pieces, how does that fit with, with what I'm doing day to day? 
get those folks. How do we make those connections, build those together? So what do you say matters most? As, as a college student, as a faculty advisor, as a faculty, teaching faculty, what really matters most to your institution for each of you to be successful? Well, the first thing is we all have to be motivated to learn. And let's be honest, we as faculty had to learn in a short amount of time how to, how to deliver everything that we had been delivering based on basic courses moved to face-to-face -face virtually within these. That may totally change the type of experience I had thought about. So what this would look at is everybody has to be um, uh, involved in the learning, motivated to learn all aspects, because it's that learning that creates that culture of learning to success, um, all of those pieces. It's that learning that builds that culture it's not the word that's all about compliance. I check off these boxes that I'm going to graduate. It doesn't matter what I do in my courses. It doesn't matter what my boxes that I've talked about. I got a degree on it. I can use it. I've checked them off. I'm ready to go. And it is simply to think about this much more than that as we move forward. And it's all about relationships. Relationships with other relationships that you have with faculty. The relationship that faculty have with each other, the relationship that faculty and, and deans have with the, the, the faculty and staff. How do we build these? Because it's all about relationships for that way, handling the difficult time of the pandemic, handling this time of being at home, is how do we build that culture of learning for how to do it at home? Those of you in here who might be single parents, because many times they know that you have to work here with them. Clear high expectations that are set fully communicated. If your faculty member came in today and it said, okay, I'll give you the beginning semester, here's a list of what you can do to get the same. Just go forth and do it. Would that, would that be the only thing you wanted to get? Or you would to say, I want to sit in a bag. I want to see what's in that bag at all, so that I can do that. So the idea of setting those high expectations, you should have the expectation that you should meet with a college advisor at least once, excuse me, at least twice every semester. One time for conversation, discussion, where we need to go. The other side is, how do I survive in this college, this business college? How do I make those connections and build those partnerships? A lot of resources, policies, practices. We have a lot of policies that need to be really looked at. Do they align with our totally online emergency classes that some of us are doing? Are they aligned with those pieces that we will become, become successful? So we need to think about aligning those policies, those practices, and procedures into one piece. And the last assessment of all learning in all places. What are you doing to assess what you've learned from an academic advisor? In the classroom, you can get a test, you can do lab work, you can go to um, all of these places that they work together. But the key becomes it's that assessment. How do I know that's successful? If I go to a learning center, and I lay more confused than I was when I got there, something's wrong with that, that cultural piece. So how do we begin to put those together? And then leadership at all levels. And, and not just, you're not just a toy. You're right there at the top of the, 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 the heap there. How do you work with students to move forward? How do you participate? How do you work with each other to move forward? How do you work with your advisor? What leadership is, are you showing on your campus? And I know at one time service learning was very important on your campus. How are you using that in order to be more successful as you move forward always becomes a question. So what are the three things that you can expect from an academic advisor and they can expect from you in order to have a real matching cultural experience, learning experience, 
as an advisor, not just get a course registration for it. That's why it's so important. So the first thing is informational guidance. They know what you need to know. They know there's a they know where the, the clock's gonna read, they know where the class is gonna start. They they've got all of this under the pat. Now you may change that in a week, but right now they have it all together. And how do we work and build that? Um, now do that intellectual mentorship. Your faculty member is not there just to tell you what's on the test. Your faculty member is there to help you figure out how do I best fit into this program or not fit into this program. And don't make it a physical reaction. Make it truly a reaction of where you want to be and how you want to be there. And then develop more relationships. Another way of looking at this is as advisees, you want people who care about you. You want people who are patient with you. And you want people who truly understand where you need to be. And so these intellectual relationships, these developmental relationships become so important as we move forward. It's important to understand we only advise you as to what to do. The decision is yours. We can help you with study skills activities. We can help you with assigning a, a, a financial aid or a, uh, a, a paper, whatever the case may be, how do I put that together? So we, all we can do is, is advise you. You have to make the decision. So how do we help you learn what you need to know in order to make that decision as you move forward? One thing that you need to think about is an old quote by a, a great scientist, Edward Jennings, and this fits so well with students and faculty and the like. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Think about that. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion or data, uh, with an opinion. So many times when you go do technology and you call someone for help, it may be that that person is not who you need to be talking to. So how do you learn who you need to connect with? How do you learn what you need to do? And then what data do you need to collect each semester around? These are things I need to talk to my advisor about. These are things I need to connect with my advisor about, with faculty about. So we can really work that way in those pieces. We'll end with this poster that I think really does summarize what advising is and what you should be. And that is, first of all, Advising should always encourage a campus of questioning. A campus where no one's questioning what you're doing, then no one really knows what you're doing. And that becomes a problem. So how do we really begin to connect those? So how do we do this advising? Well, the first thing is we need to understand that we're encouraging you. We're telling you all those days that, you know, Mr. I just can't do it. Well, tell me what's wrong. Tell me how I fix that. How may, how may I work with you? So that big piece is there. We support critical thinking. You could not have gotten to college without hearing the concept of critical thinking, and now we have a definition for it. Critical thinking is everything I need to know in that book that wasn't the reading assignment, meaning that you better engage in more than just the required work because they want to engage you in everything they're talking about. We need, to, vote. We need to, to support critical thinking. When you do have an opinion different, when you do have a, a political view that's different or a religious view that's different or whatever the case may be, please understand that you are working with someone who the, who the um, university believes in, but more importantly, the university believes in you as students. And how do we build that? We got to boost spirits. When you're down, you need to be the one that's cheerleading or boosting someone who isn't. Because when you're down, they're going to come back to you. How do you do that? Because it's so important to realize that we really boost the spirits of each other. For many times, if you're asked, tell me what your favorite course was. Many times it has nothing to do with the content. It has to do with that faculty member that was connected to that. So how do we make sure that those relationships those building pieces are all together. We inspire dreams. We want you to dream bigger than you ever thought. We want you to dream about where you want to be and how to get there. And we want to be part of that process 
of your dream making, of your dream deciding, and how to move that forward. We need to cultivate learning among ourselves, and then lastly, to recognize that we as advisors are the ones who advise. You are the ones who take the advice and move forward with it. So as you're working with your advisors, a question I would, would like to ask of you is to say to your advisor, well, why, is the, why are these things stuck inside my, my uh, processes when we move forward? How do we think of those? How do we pull those together? Because we advise. We help you as you move through the process. I hope I've given you some ideas to think about. I hope I've given you some thoughts on where you can move forward and how you might think about what you need to do. This is a time of change. This is a time in which we talk about going back to normal, but we know there's never really going to be a normal like we knew it. And higher education, while it's going to look different, it's going to be just as great. But it can only be that way if you as students, we as faculty members and advisors work together. Because it's that partnership, it's that sense of community, that sense of belonging at Millersville among your faculty and the, the advisees and you that make Millersville a wonderful place to visit. Margaret, I was there 25 years ago on your campus and remember still how beautiful your campus is. And it's a campus with a rich tradition of student success a rich tradition of being a leader in student success and being a leader in how students really engage on campuses. So I want you all to think about how do you continue that reputation, that connection in this new and virtual world is by really building those partnerships, building those relationships and moving forward. So Margaret, thank you so much for allowing me to, to speak today to be a part of it and thank you so much i'm done thank you thank you very uh thank you very much uh dr nat i want to request if you can uh please speak briefly uh on slide number 10 and 11 there was a lot of cracking noise sound if you can just summarize very briefly I, I, we could i do here what they were give me just a second i'm sorry i don't know what was going on i apologize no problem. 10 and 11? 10 and 11, yes. Okay. So what should matter most for students is the cracking gall, Margaret? Yes. Okay. So what should matter most to you and to students and to faculty advisors is being motivated to learn, being motivated to achieve more, being motivated to not just take courses, but to actually learn what you need to do. But also on the advisor's part, on your faculty's part, we've got to be motivated to learn about how to help students be more successful. Faculty are hired because of expertise in a subject matter. But now we have to think about how do we learn, how do we carry this learning into virtual experiences? So all of us need to be motivated to learn in these new aspects. It's a time to recognize more than ever before how important relationships are and building those relationships because in this virtual world, it's not going to be as easy as it used to be. So how do we think about doing that? We need to set some clear, high expectations for your, for your learning. It's not enough just to pass a course. What is it I want to do and achieve? Maybe a higher expectation than just passing, but it's actually being the most successful possible. But even more importantly, what's that expectation you want to set for how you build a relationship with your faculty advisor? We don't want you just to set the minimum of I'll see my advisor to get scheduled, but I really want to see my advisor, which is a learning experience and helping me to decide where I want to go, what the future is. We need to, to, to make sure our policies and procedures are up to date, particularly this new virtual world, because there's so many things that we're going to need to do virtually that we can't do, that we, that we used to do face-to-face. -face. And, and then that assessment of learning, how do we learn? How do we assess what works for us? If you do very well on a test or an essay or a project or an internship or whatever the thing is that you did good in, 
did you go back and assess why you did it so well? We tend to only do assessment when we don't do well on something. I made an F on that essay. What are all the things I didn't do well? But when you make an A, you don't really go back and assess all the things that you did to get that A. So how do we assess those and move those forward? And then that from advisors, students can expect three things. Informational guidance, intellectual mentorship, development relationships. And I think what that really means, Margaret, is from an advisor. Students need to understand that, that they can recognize that advisors care about them. That that's a, a caring relationship. That advisors know the material, know the information, know where they can build that information, find that information for you to be successful. So they care about you, they know information, and then they want to build that relationship. They want to be there for you, particularly in this virtual world, when everything's being done virtually, how do you build those together? Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate. If you have any questions, please put your question in the chat. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nat is going to answer your questions. Uh, I have some questions from students, uh, Dr. Nat, if you can look at the chat. The ones that you wrote there, Margaret? Yes, I, I got some from the students privately. Okay, all right. <clears throat> I think nurturing strained relationships is an area that we really have to focus on, thinking about how we do that virtually, think about how we build those. One of the things we want to think about is what do we want that relationship to be? So if it's, if it's strayed, what would it look like if it was a, 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 a positive relationship? And then think about what you want to get out of that, and then that way you can move forward. Um, I think that advisors are just like you are as students. We're all learning how to do everything we do in a virtual world. And how do we respond in a timely manner? especially when, it, when all responses tend to have to be done virtually. So I think one of the things we want to do is, first of all, be realistic about what way too long means. You know, you send me a message at 10 a.m. and I don't get back to you till 3. Well, that may be because I was teaching classes between then or I was in these meetings between then and I got back to you as quickly as I could. That may seem like a strain, a long amount of time, but being realistic with students about when you're available. And then students, you recognize that just because you've sent a text on email, that not everyone is available at that very moment to respond. So thinking about, but then having those relationships with your advisors. You know, what's the expectation? If I, if I email you a question, when can, when can I expect an answer back? so that you know what the expectation is and advisors know what your expectation is. And somewhere in the middle is that compromise and how do we build that? I think it's really important that we begin to recognize that that time connected with students is something we have to take more time to do, whether it be virtually or whether it be in social distancing, but that it is, it is going to take more of your energy and time than it did before. It's going to take much more of your wanting to build that relationship to make those happen as you go forward. So, Margaret, I think we're about to the end, so I'll leave that with those questions there. And just thank you so much. I'm so excited to have been here with you. Students, have a wonderful semester. Um, do great work. I know you want to, and I know you will. Um, and it's just been wonderful to be a part of this today, Margaret. Thank you so very much. Um, one second. Uh, I know you have a very busy schedule, Dr. Nat, and uh, we would hope that you would come back and answer the questions. Students have a lot of questions, and I will be forwarding those questions to you. I got more questions from students and I after I get the answers from you I'll forward them to the students but we 
if you would send those to me, I'll answer those, send them back to you, and then you can share with all students because many students might have had that question but didn't ask it. So I'll Absolutely. share with all of them. I will do that. We are so grateful for your time. We thank you for your willingness to come and share with our students and ourselves. And to the students and all who attended today, I thank you so much for registering and actually showing up for the presentation. We hope you have learned something today. And the speaker series, as Dr. Godino said, is an ongoing uh, initiative. We meet every other Wednesday by Zoom. We have speakers lined up. Please look for the announcements in, in Bill Daily and also in the events calendar. Thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie Nat, for coming. We really appreciate you being here once again. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.